Welcome to Phoenix Masonry Live, a show that brings you talented Freemasons, Masonic authors, artists, craftsmen, and brothers of accomplishment. I am Frederick L. Milliken, Executive Director of Phoenix Masonry, and we are here to celebrate our Freemasonry. That's what we do at Phoenix Masonry. We celebrate our Freemasonry. Today's video is titled, Reaching Out to Masonic Seekers. In this video, I would like to address the many non-Masons out there who have hesitated to join the fraternity because they really don't understand what Masonry is all about. So I am making this video to reach out to all those seekers who want to add meaning to their lives, but fail to see Masonry as the way to go. I think they fail to see that masonry is the way to go because nobody has explained to them what masonry does for them. Not what masonry is, but what it does for the individual. What it does. It all started when the three writers on freemasonryinformation.com a couple of years ago, Tim Bryce, Greg Stewart, and myself, each wrote an article on what is Freemasonry. And believe me, these two other authors, Bryce and Stewart, are way beyond me as a writer. Bryce stayed, started it off, and while I won't read his entire article, I will quote the following. Freemasonry is a fraternity, the original fraternity, and the model for others who came much later, such as college fraternities. The term fraternity comes from the Latin word frater, meaning brother. Fraternity, therefore, is a brotherhood, an environment of companionship dedicated to the social development of its members. The basic tenets of Freemasonry are friendship, morality, and brotherly love. As such, it is designed to build character, devotion, and encourage its members to lead an honorable life. Attending a Masonic Lodge meeting is intended to act as a fortress of solitude for its members, both local and visiting Masons, where they can meet and find solace away from the vermin and troubles of the world. It is a place where men seek understanding, compassion, and to be treated fairly and honestly. Freemasonry, therefore, is not a club, a philanthropy, a religion, or a pack. Using symbols from ancient operative masonry, Freemasonry is a place where men meet on the level to promote equality, act by the plumb, rectitude of conduct, and part upon the square to practice morality. For many centuries, Freemasonry is the only fraternity where men of character have naturally gravitated to, simply because they yearn for such simple treatment. Those who think of or practice Freemasonry any other way are missing the boat. Greg Stewart, in his response, writes, as a fraternity, Tim's conclusion is that while not a club, philanthropy, religion, or political action committee, Freemasonry is a place where, and I'm paraphrasing here, moral men meet on common ground to act rightly to one another. He concludes saying that men gathered like this for no more reason than to associate so. While I can't find a disagreement on that conclusion, one has to ask, gather to for what end? For what end? Stuart continues, this brings us back to the ultimate conclusion then of what the fraternity is to those who have sought it out. Is it the sum of its parts or the individual definitions of its pieces? How can it be none of the things Tim described when in its operation and its roots, it is essentially 
all of those things. To quote from Tim's piece, Freemasonry, therefore, is not a club, a philanthropy, a religion, or a pack. Using symbols from ancient operative masonry, Freemasonry is a place where men meet on the level, act upon the plum, and part upon the square. To the contrary, I would suggest that masonry is a club that ultimately promotes philanthropy and religion in the same way a PAC or a corporation functions to grow and promote its own prosperity and agenda. That the ideas of the fraternity do go back centuries, but go well past the common vernacular of the 17th century to their more ancient usage in antiquity to the mystery cults of association by common cause. The only difference is in how we choose to see ourselves as the individual that the corporate body represents or as in the incorporation of the idea itself in the individual. Can Freemasonry, like the elephant, be defined in its totally, in its totality based based upon parts, or is it a philosoph philosophical idea merely codified in its organization for its conduct? I think Tim got it partially right, but I don't think you can sum the totality of Freemasonry without rightly considering its parts. Now we come to my response to both Bryce and Stewart. And what I did was try to explain what Masonry does not what it is. In other words, what is needed here is not a clinical definition of Freemasonry, but what it means to those who are members. Both Tim and Greg have attempted to define Freemasonry as an intellectual enterprise of definition devoid of the feelings of individual Freemasons. And it is precisely those feelings that help define the craft. Sometimes what counts is not reality, but perception. One needs to get a sense of what motivates a person to join Freemasonry. Those reasons shed a lot of light on how Freemasonry is perceived and how it is perceived is really what it is to flesh and bone human beings. The craft then becomes not what one wants it to be, but what it in reality is to its practitioners. That is not to take to task my fellow writers, for I do not disagree with their conclusions. I come not to bury Caesar, but to praise him, which is a little twist on a famous quote. I just don't think that they, that their cases, they, they take their cases far enough. Stuart tells us, as a fraternity, Tim's conclusion is that, while not a club, philanthropy, religion, or political action committee, Freemasonry is a place where, and I'm paraphrasing here, moral men meet on common ground to act rightly to one another. He concludes saying that men gathered like this for no more reason than to associate so. While I can't find a disagreement on that conclusion, one has to gather two for what end. That's a good question. I will ask again and answer later. I don't think Stuart ever really answered it. But first, I would point out, as I have done many times before, that Freemasons are on different levels of Masonic development and practice. What one Mason sees in the craft, another does not. What one man practices in Freemasonry, another shuns. Some see Freemasonry as a philosophical society. Some as a social organization. Some as just a means to networking. Some as a claim to prestige. Some as a way of life. Some as a bonding of like thinking human beings. And some to more than one of these things at the same time. I think what Stuart was saying is that they are all right. What we perceived is shaped greatly by our personal experiences. 
our environment. I have had the pleasure to experience Prince Hall Freemasonry, unlike Bryce and Stewart, who have not. And in that experience, I've had the joy of some very tight bonding. Brothers in Prince Hall hug or embrace each other, always and often. There is a real concern for our brother's well-being. We not only pray for a brother in distress or mourning, but we do the same for our sisters in the Order of Eastern Star and the heroines of Jericho. We will not hesitate to provide direct aid. We tend to work together on projects outside of Freemasonry. There is one big word to describe this experience, family. In Prince Hall, we are all family. Now I'm by no means putting down mainstream Freemasonry in this regard. I am sure that there is the same concern there. But to me and for me, its stiff upper lip, stand offness, is a sharp contrast and demonstration of that concern. I am once reminded of the words of H. L. Haywood, who writes, Freemasonry does not exist in a world where brotherhood is a mere dream flying along the sky. It exists in a world of which brotherhood is the law of human life. Its function is not to bring brotherhood into existence just as a hothouse gardener may at last coax into bloom a frail flower though the climate is most unfriendly, but to lead men to understand that brotherhood is already a reality, a law, and that it is not until we come to know it as such and practice it that we can ever find happiness together. Freemasonry does not create something too fine and good for this rough world. It reveals something that it is as much a part of the world as roughness itself. In other words, it removes the hoodwink of jealousy, hatred, unkindness, and all the other myriad forms of unbrotherliness in order that a man may see and thus come to know how good and pleasant a thing it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The hoodwink or cloth, the hoodwink of cloth or leather that is bound over a man's eyes is not the real hoodwink at all, but only the symbol thereof, the real hoodwink. And it is that which Freemasonry undertakes to re remove from a man's eyes is all that antisocial and unhuman spirit out of which grow the things that make life unkind and unhappy. Brotherhood is heaven. The lack of brotherhood is hell. So, Freemasonry is a brotherhood with camaraderie. Okay, but what difference does it make what it is? Isn't it really all about what it does, especially for the individual Freemason? So what does Freemasonry provide to its members? My answer is that it provides community. Everybody needs community, from the gangbanger to the single mother with three children to the Freemason. It is an inherent need of all humankind, the social animals that we are. If you have read Scott Peck's The Road Less Traveled, time, the timeless edition a new psychology of love, traditional values, and spiritual growth. You know what I'm talking about. In case you haven't, Peck has a brief explanation of community for us. Here is a non-Mason who talks like one. These seven points he makes are vital to what Masonry does for its members, what it does. Number one, Peck says, inclusivity, commitment, and consensus. Members accept and embrace each other, 
celebrating their individuality and transcending their differences. They commit themselves to the effort and the people involved. They make decisions and reconcile their differences through consensus. And I add to this point, and let us emphasize this point, Masons celebrate their individuality and transcend their differences. They transcend their differences. Number two, Peck talks about realism. Members bring together multiple perspectives to better understand the whole context of the situation. Decisions are more well-rounded and humble rather than one-sided and arrogant. Number three, Peck talks about contemplation. Members examine, examine themselves. They are individually and collectively self-aware of the world outside themselves, the world inside themselves, and the relationship between the two. And I add to this point, Masons look inside a lot. Self-improvement is a big part of what masonry provides the means to obtain for its members. Peck's fourth point, a safe place. Members allow others to share their vulnerability, heal themselves, and express who they really are. And I add to this point, masons can be vulnerable with each other. The closeness among brothers leads to letting it all hang out. Peck's fifth point, a laboratory for personal disarmament. Members exper experientially discover the rules for peacemaking and embrace its virtues. They feel and express compassion and respect for each other as fellow human beings. I add to this point, every lodge is a haven of peace. Nothing that divides people is allowed to be a part of the Masonic experience. It's all about what brings us together. Peck's six point, a group that can fight gracefully. Members resolve conflicts with wisdom and grace. They listen and understand, respect each other's gifts, accept each other's limitations, celebrate their differences, bind each other's wounds and commit to a struggle together rather than against each other. And I add, we disagree gracefully. We do not fight or quarrel as Masons. And Peck's seventh and last point, a group of all leaders. Members harness the flow of leadership to make decisions and set a course of action. It is the spirit of community itself that leads and not a single individual. And I add, most Masons tend to be leaders and a shining example to their community. I think Bryce and Stewart are trying to make the symptoms the disease. So if Freemasonry is community, we are back to Stewart's question. We promise to answer. For what purpose? First of all, to be community. That's enough of an explanation in itself. But to personalize it more to Freemasonry, to be a very special community of morality and purpose with a message to practice all of the above, all that's, that Stuart and Bryce have talked about. But also, and very important, also to provide the tools necessary for a brother to grow, to grow in wisdom, in relationships, in closeness to God. Masonry brings together totally different people of different races, different religions, different economic circumstances, different political persuasions, and different cultures, and puts them together and makes them all one in peace and harmony. You won't get that anywhere else in any other organization. Freemasonry, in fact, 
is not just an organization. It's not just a fraternity. It's a way of life. An unknown author had this to say. If we understand the Lodge to be a representation of a man's life, then it is not hard to see progress through the degrees as representing his life journey. The temple we call the Lodge is the same as was, as was suggested to us by St. Paul. Know ye not that you, ye are the temple of the living God. When a candidate knocks on the door of the Lodge, the Lodge is already there, complete and perfect, waiting for him to enter. Such a place that we call the Lodge is a representation of the human psyche. When we enter, we must understand the physical Lodge to be a metaphor for what is within our own living temple of consciousness. The Masonic journey, then, is an exploration of our own psyche or soul according to a plan which is set out in the path of our degrees. The object of initiation is transformation. This is why we call Freemasonry a transformative art. We are told early on that we are here to improve ourselves. To me, this means that we are engaged in a process of casting off the psychological posture that we happen to be in at the time and awaken our slumbering consciousness so that we may come into a better condition to perfect this temple of God which is within us. The whole idea of progress in masonry is to achieve higher levels of consciousness. Our degrees represent a path of consciousness. This involves leaving one condition or state of mind and arriving through contemplation, development, and study at another. It is a moving from such things as ignorance to knowledge, from confusion to understanding, from passion to love. The whole purpose of our ritual is to bring about change within us. The experience is supposed to redefine us. The life before we are Masons is one thing. The life afterward is another. I'll leave you with this thought. Masonry is the only group, however you wish to label it, that will provide you with the tools so that you can work on yourself to be a better person, to be all God wants you to be. It is also the only group that bonds fellow humans together so closely that you will be willing to die for another brother if the need should arise. It is then the only group you can join outside of your house of worship that will develop your soul while at the same time develop your relationships with other human beings and your relationship with the Almighty. Masonry is family. Masonry is a way of life. Before you try to change the world, before you join a secular group without a moral compass, think of yourself and all you would like to be. Join masonry first and live a life of purpose and fulfillment. In addition to non-masons who might be looking at masonry, those that are already in the craft, please consider passing on this video to those you know who would benefit from it. In conclusion, it's all about living, not just existing. But when the end comes and you look back, you don't want to review a life that was wasted. With that thought in mind, I leave you with these two quotes. The fear of death follows from the fear of life. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. Mark Twain. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. Braveheart. And that's all we have for you today. This is Frederick L. Milliken, Parting on the Square.
pots.